Hey everybody, Evan Tobias here. It's another recap and extension of our class. This is a music learning and teaching class oriented around designing and facilitating secondary, comprehensive, and contemporary music programs. Today's class, we thought about three driving questions. One, how might context, place, and people relate to music learning and teaching? How might music learning and teaching be biased and even racist? And what are some specific steps music educators can take to support and foster inclusive learning communities in a music program? Most of what we did today was centered around um, the context of creating music online using web-based music apps. Now, we talked about the idea that these apps are not exclusive to online music making. You could use these apps in a physical classroom, you could use these apps in hybrid settings, and you can use these apps in online settings the key is that they are low barrier entry point. As long as you have internet access, you can access the majority of these apps. These apps are going to be a context that we can use to explore many of the themes that we're discussing throughout the semester in terms of learning and teaching. But right now, they're just an opportunity for us to engage in music making and creating. So some of the apps that you chose to discuss today were Calm by Tones, Copeland, Groove Pizza, Shiny Happy Web Audio Drum Machine 1.0, and Accordion. As you started using the apps, I reminded you that um, two classes ago, I simply provided you with a list of apps and just told you to explore, to have fun, to play around, try things out, and just get a sense of how some of the apps worked and kind of settle in on one and, and play around with it longer, but there weren't really any parameters given. And we talked about how um, often we don't provide students with enough time to explore before giving them an, um, a set of parameters that they need to work within or an assignment. And so we discussed the idea of exploration and play as something important for classes to do and how um, this class, we were, I was giving you additional time to play and explore, but I framed it with some questions. So we looked at that app analysis and inquiry doc. The purpose of this is to help us develop the dispositions and habits of mind so we can have a framework to a, use as a lens whenever we see apps or see people providing apps as resources or suggestions so that um, we don't straight out make a decision of, oh, this is a great app or this is not a great app, that we kind of filter our decisions about the apps we might, be, we might use through a framework of some kind. So if you think back to questions that we were answering, one of them was, what does this app do? And how, how, how do we answer that based on our exploration? Um, what do I think I know about this app? What do I want or need to know about this app? What am I curious about in relation to this app? How might this app help me or others be musical? How might I use this technology to support others engage or learn music? And why would or wouldn't I integrate this app in my own musicianship learning and teaching? Now, how we answer these questions is not just specific to the app itself, but it reveals a lot about our own thinking, about our own experiences, about our own biases, about our own values. It reveals a lot about who we are as musicians and how we might teach. So when we think about technology or we think about apps, the information that we use is not just based in an object, the app, or even our engagement with the app. So much of who we are as people and musicians and educators show up in the way that we answer these questions. The way we were talking about the visual representation of music and the way that these apps allowed us to engage with them or the, the, the kinds of engagement that these apps supported revealed how we think about music. And one of the things I encourage you to do was to reflect on your own musicianship and reflect on the ways that you think about music um, because they will have a huge impact on the way that you teach. Each of these apps provided us with a context to have a conversation around some of the ideas and concepts from chapter four of the Lyndon McCoy book. And one of the things that we kept coming back to were how our frames of reference, how the ways that we think about music impact not only the ways that we engage with these apps, but also our perceptions of whether we might use them in a music classroom or not, and how we might use them in a music classroom. For instance, today we had a conversation about how bias can show up in music classrooms and how we were thinking about the apps and what the apps can do or can't do or why we may or may not use the apps. Just the way that we describe the apps, show, our bias shows up sometimes and the, our, our experiences and our ways of thinking about music. So we have to be really careful being aware of how our perspectives are woven into our practice and woven into our decision making. So I think it would be pretty interesting for you to go back and think through the apps and the ways that we were discussing the apps in relationship to 
the three generative questions that were guiding our class today. So if you think about these apps, how might context, place, and people relate to music learning and teaching? And how might music learning and teaching be biased and even racist? This is something that we talked about a bit in terms of our own biases and how they show up in the ways that we think about using resources and tools and um, processes. And then what are some spe specific steps music educators can take to support and foster inclusive learning communities in a music program? Another thing we talked about was music curriculum at the secondary in secondary programs in middle schools and high schools. And one of the things we talked about was how there's sometimes this phenomenon where the, the further you go along to middle school and up through high school, sometimes the fewer students you see in the music program. And we had a conversation about how this might be deliberate or how this might be sort of baked into the way we think about our program. Not just what classes do we offer, but how are we thinking about who the program serves? And we did get into a conversation about how some students are just not interested in music programs. But we talked through this assumption that because a student is not in the music program doesn't mean that the reason that they're not in the program is because they want to focus more on another discipline. That certainly there are those students, but perhaps the ways that we've designed our program exclude some students who might otherwise be in that program. And if we created classes that were more broad, that were more comprehensive, we might find more students in the music program. One of the themes that kept coming up in our conversation was this idea that, yes, we ought to foster a supportive learning environment in our classrooms, and that it's very difficult to do that if we don't get to know the students who are in our program. And again, this came up in other classes prior to this week, but this idea that we shouldn't make assumptions about students in our classes, we should take the time to get to know them and build that into the classes themselves. And so even though we were working with apps, the focus of the class wasn't on web-based music apps as a tool. As you'll see over the next couple of classes, this is really serving as a context to explore various types of curricular and pedagogical issues in music learning and teaching. And you'll also notice that that idea of project being a context to address issues of music learning and teaching is a way that I've structured this class throughout the entire semester. We'll often engage in projects, and while the purpose of the project is partly to engage in music in a particular way, to troubleshoot, to see how something might work in a classroom, often in the context of a music learning and teaching course at a university for music learning and teaching majors, often these projects are serving as context for us to work through principles of learning and teaching, issues that might arise in your future music teaching, um, as a way to take some of the things that we're reading and put them into context, to put them into practice. So take another look at chapter four from Culture Responsive Teaching and Music Education by Linda McCoy and think about communities and caring in music programs. Consider the bias norms in music programs and then apply these ideas to think more deeply about the technology that we do and don't use and how we situate technology such as apps in relationship to music, learning, and teaching and to aspects of culture, to aspects of community, and to the ways that we think about musicianship and how that might be tied up to our bias. If you find any of this helpful, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. I'll be doing more of these recap videos. Also check out evantobias.net where you can find a bunch of links and resources related to these videos. I'd also love to hear your perspective on any of these issues. So go ahead and put some comments in, whether it has to do with how you support communities in your program, what you're thinking about in terms of how biases show up in music learning and teaching, whether it's in your program or in other programs. Take care and see you soon. Thanks for watching.